Okay, uh, now it's done. And let me briefly introduce our speaker. And Michael is currently a postdoc research fellow at University of Wollongong, and his research interests include large scale spatial temporal pro problems in environmental statistics, spatial temporal flux inversion for trace gases using remotely sensed data, hierarchical Bayesian mixture models for the analysis of Australian daily rainfall, and also modeling multiple non stationary time series in the spectral domain. So now let us welcome his talk about Adapt Spec X spectral analysis of multiple non stationary time series. Please. Okay, thank you. Oh. Good to go? Yeah, please. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so I'll just ask the three obligatory questions. So can everyone hear me just fine? Um, and the other question is, can you, you see the slides okay? Um, and the last question is, can you see my mouse? It's a bit small, but I, I'm sort of waving it around the middle of the screen. Is that okay? Yep. That's great. I need to, it's like talking with your hands. I'm half Italian, so it's really important. And the mouse is the best thing that I get. So, um, okay. So yeah, my name is Michael Bertolacci. I'm a postdoc at the University, University of Wollongong, and I'm really happy to be here today. So thank you so much for the invitation to speak. And today I'm going to talk about some work from my PhD. Uh, and I did that at the University of Western Australia way back when WA was a place that you could go to. Uh, and this work concerns our method, uh, ADAPT Spec X, uh, as for spectral analysis of multiple non stationary time series. <clears throat> and this is joint work with these fine people. So Ed Cripps and John Lauer are at UWA, and Sally Cripps is at University of Sydney and Ari Rosen is at the University of Texas in El Paso. So I'll take you through a, a few things today. Um, first, I'll give a little bit of time, uh, time series 101 uh, on spectral analysis, just to make sure we're all up, uh, re you know, remember what we learned in, in our undergraduate. Um, and then I'll talk about the univariate method ADAPT spec uh, that forms the basis of, of, of ADAPT spec X. Uh, then I'll talk about ADAPT Spec X itself, um, uh, some simulation study work, and finally some application. So some background. So this is really time series 101. Um, let's assume that YT is a stationary zero mean time series. And here, uh, there are a few definitions of stationary, but here by stationary, I mean that this, uh, this first property holds, which is that the auto covariance is just a function of the lag uh, between two observations. So H is the lag. So you have YT plus H and YT, and you've got some auto covariance, and, and you've got the covariance between the two is just a function of the lag. So you can sort of translate up and down the time series and, and the auto covariance stays the same. Uh, and sometimes this is called weakly stationary. And of course, you know, we have this auto covariance function, uh, I would call it gamma, uh, there's a time series, an example on the bottom, uh, and this is its auto covariance function. Uh, so uh, there's some dependence over time here, and you can sort of you can see that by eyeballing the time series. But you know, you, when you look at the auto covariance function, you can see you can see that too because it doesn't go down to zero. Uh, now, under some conditions we can actually get gamma as the inverse Fourier transform of some other function f, uh, f of omega. And omega is the frequency and it's measured in cycles per unit of time here. Uh, so if for example, omega equals 0 0.1 would correspond to a 10 time period cycle. And this object f is called the spectral density. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's a really, really important object scientifically. Um, uh, and it quantifies how much each frequency contributes to the variance of Y. Basically, that's pretty much the simplest way to describe it. Um, and this plot shows, uh, well, the log of F corresponding to the gamma from before. So it's the same time series. Uh, and it, I'll just pop backwards a slide. So you can see there's this sort of wavy structure in this auto covariance function uh, in, in the, in the uh, in the spectral density, it, it comes up and has a peak and then comes down. The peak is just below, just below 0 0.1. Uh, and that indicates a lot, of a lot of the variance coming from around this frequency. And it suggests a cycle of roughly every 10 to 11 observations. Uh, 
And if you look at the time series below, that's about right. So th this is the spectral density. It, it, it's a very well studied object. Um, and it's a really useful object because, because it relates, uh, it relates, uh, it, it, it can have a physical interpretation in, in terms of a uh, say time series that uh, uh, measurements of natural phenomena that have cycles or, and so on. So very useful object. <clears throat> Uh, and actually, whilst the previous two slides were about stationary processes, these spectral methods can be extended to non-stationary processes by letting the spectral density vary with time. And we can write this as f of omega t, just one way to write it. Uh, so now the spectrum is a, a function of both frequency, omega, and time t. Uh, and this object is, is, is often called the time varying spectral density or, or sometimes the evolutionary spectrum, uh, but I'll call it the time varying spectral density. <clears throat> and this lets the variance decomposition change over time. So for example, the top plot shows a realization from a time series and the bottom plot shows its time varying spectral density. Uh, but just to take care that the uh, the axes are flipped, so time uh, for the spectral density, I mean. So time is on the horizontal axis and now frequency is on the vertical axis versus the previous, the previous uh, slide. And that's how it's gonna be for the rest of this talk. Um, and the color in the bottom plot shows the value of F, the spectral density or log F, more to the point. <clears throat> and if you look at the time series above, its characteristics change over time. Uh, and that's mirrored in the spectral density. So for example, in the beginning, there's short-term dependence, but, but no real cycles as far as you can see by the eye. Uh, and sure enough, in the spectral density, there are no peaks except at, at zero. And zero is a uh, low frequency noise. And that really corresponds directly to what we would usually call uh, um, short-term dependence. Uh, and then it switches to a regime that has what looks like some cyclical behavior. Um, and then it switches again to an even more cyclical behavior. And you can see this mirrored in the, mirrored in the spectrum, uh, in the spectrum below. So now there are some peaks in the, in the latter half of the time series, but it changes again. Uh, and in, in the previous example, the spectrum changed abruptly, but in general spectra can change slowly as well. So here's an example there. So looking at the spectra, the time series starts with a completely flat spectra uh, and a flat spectra actually corresponds to white noise. So no autocorrelation at all. <clears throat> and then as time passes, it smoothly becomes more autocorrelated, uh, more correlated <clears throat> until it's quite correlated by the end. And if you look at the time series, you can see that mirrored. So as time goes on, increasingly, increasingly its deviations away from the mean start to persist. Uh, and of course, it's possible that a time series could contain both, both abrupt and gradual changes. And one of the nice things about working with time varying spectral densities is that they can accommodate both types of changes. So, so we've just seen, you know, to recap, we've seen we've had, got abrupt changes in this time varying spectral density and, and slow changes in, in this one. So. And, and, and so that's probably the background you need to, to, to get into the next section, which is about ADAPT-SPEC. Uh, that's an acronym. It stands for Adaptive uh, Spectral Estimation for Non-Stationary Time Series. And, and this, is, this is work uh, from, from my uh, collaborators uh, that they did in 2012, Rosenwood and Stoker. Uh, and they presented in, in JASA um, a Bayesian method for estimating time varying spectral densities for univariate time series. Uh, and it works by splitting a time series. So here's that same example at the top, splitting them into stationary segments. And I've indicated the segments, example segments. I mean, here we get to know them exactly because I generated the time series, uh, but I've indicated these segments using these purple lines. Uh, and in adapt spec, the number of cut points or segments and their locations. So where these segments are positioned are considered unknown and they're estimated. Uh, within a segment, <clears throat> within a segment, it's assumed to be stationary. Uh, so, so I'll take you through that. So if we let, if we suppose that YS is the data within a segment, um, we use uh, the adapt spec uses um, 
the widow likelihood, which is a useful non-parametric um, uh, approximation. Uh, so it's actually a remarkable formula. It's this first one here. So if you have the spectral density, uh, the likelihood of the time, uh, the time series YS is approximated as this expression on the right. Uh, and Whittle in 1957 showed that this holds asymptotically for a large range of time series. Uh, and the idea is that you take the discrete Fourier transform of, of the data, uh, compute the periodogram. Um, actually, there's an error here. This is, I've written, uh, oh, I have to correct that. I've written the Fourier transform here as though it's a periodogram, but actually it should be the, uh, the, uh, the square uh, of, of this expression. Apologies for that. Uh, but you take the periodogram, <clears throat> uh, and then if you know the spectral density, you can approximate the likelihood. And the longer the time series is, the more accurate this approximation is. So the spectral density comes in two places. It comes out the front here. Uh, there's a product of terms equal to the number of um, observations, uh, and then it comes out uh, and then it comes out in this exponential term here. Uh, and in our case, of course, we don't know the spectral density. Uh, so we model it, uh, so we model it um, as unknown. Um, and we model its logarithm actually, and assume that that's a Gaussian process. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Gaussian processes, they're a flexible family of stochastic processes that are often used in Bayesian statistics as a prior on functions. <clears throat> and different GPs, uh, which is short for Gaussian process, imply different assumptions about smoothness and differentiability and other properties of the underlying function. Uh, and I won't go into it here, but there are some choices in that regard that are important for the log spectrum. And finally, we also allow the mean in the spectra, uh, in, the, in the segment to, to be unknown uh, and estimated. Uh, and we give that a prior. Uh, and uh, this structure here using, using the Whittle likelihood um, um, uh, having a prior, a Gaussian process prior on the log spectrum. That, that goes back uh, quite a long way um, uh, from uh, the ideas were really developed in Waba, by Waba in 1980, uh, and it's formed the basis for a lot of spectral methods since. Um, and in, in adapt spec, uh, it takes the previous stationary building block, so non-parametric modeling of the spectrum within a segment and joins them together using a cut point model, like I said before. Uh, and you can write that like this. So the whole time series that you're interested in Y is a sum of, uh, a sum of different, um, the different segments where, they, where those processes turn on and off, depending on the cut points. Uh, and importantly, the cut points, uh, so the locations of the segment boundaries and the number of segments are assumed unknown. Uh, they're assigned a prior and they're estimated using MCMC. So we're going to group them into capital, uh, capital theta, prior P of theta. Uh, estimation uses MCMC. And what this gives us is a posterior distribution on, on more or less everything. Uh, so it gives you a posterior distribution, of course, on the number and the locations of the segments, uh, the mean and spectrum within the segment. Uh, and as a function of that, you can compute the estimates of the time varying spectrum F and the time varying mean mu of T. Uh, and I haven't really shown the math for it, but it can handle missing values as well, if you have some missing values in the time series. <clears throat> so that's the DAP spec. Um, and here's an example uh, of, of using it to estimate time varying spectral densities uh, based on those two processes I showed earlier, the abruptly changing one and the slowly changing one. So, on the left uh, is it, uh, plots for the uh, abruptly changing one, and the truth is, the truth is, the true spectrum is on the bottom, and the posterior is on the top. Uh, and you can see, adapt spec does a pretty good job. Uh, remember that we didn't tell it where the locations of these segments are; it just figured that out. Uh, and the spectra look pretty, pretty good. Um, and then for the slowly varying one, it's actually a bit of a surprise. So the estimated spectra, the posterior mean on the top is actually pretty smooth. I mean, there's some evidence of cut points, but there's quite a smooth change here. And, and, and I guess this could be considered surprising because uh, if you recall, the model adapt spec has sharp cut points, uh, but because the cut points are considered unknown, uh, in the posterior, we have a distribution over the cut points uh, and that distribution can be quite smooth um, and that can translate into a smooth uh, 
estimate of the time varying spectrum, which is what's happened here. So it, it, it's always an interesting property of, of Bayesian models when, uh, when you can get in the generative process, you might not have the property that you want uh, in the sense of say smooth smoothness, but in the posterior, you can have that property sometimes and, and we can use that here. So in this case, um, I, I would say adapt spec again does a pretty good job. It, it, it understands that time series doesn't have much dependence in the early stage, uh, the dependence ramps up, and then and then by the end of the time varying spectrum, there's a lot of power on the low on the low frequencies, which is what the truth suggests it should be. Uh, so that's that's adapt spec. Uh, that's the base method, uh, and it works for univariate time series. And as part of my PhD, I extended adapt spec to multiple time series linked by covariates. Uh, so now the setting is that we have capital N time series, so Y1 through Yn, and each of those has covariates S1 through Sn. Now these covariates aren't time varying, they're, they're a property of the time series. Um, and in all the examples that I'm going to show, they're actually spatial locations, so the location at which the time series was collected. But, but in general, the method can handle uh, uh, general covariates, but, but that's, what, that's what we'll talk about. Uh, and the key objects of interest are the covariate dependent time varying spectrum. Uh, so we've got S again, this familiar object, but I've added another, in, another, another argument S. So now the spectrum is a function of frequency, time, and covariate. Uh, and, and, and the time and the covariate dependent time varying mean too. So time, and that depends on the time and the covariate. <clears throat> And because we have these covariates, it, it opens the possibility of predicting at unobserved S. Uh, so for spatial locations, that would mean predicting at unobserved locations, uh, which could have important physical implications. For example, the, the, you, you, you may want to predict uh, the variability of, of a natural phenomena. Uh, later, we'll talk about rainfall at a location, uh, at a location away from where you have measurements. Um, uh, and, and, and that's the goal with this method is, is not just to, to estimate uh, the spectra at the locations, but, but estimated it at, other lo at unobserved locations too. So we'll see that soon. But we extend, the way that we extend the DAP spec to, to multiple time series is with a covariate dependent mixture model. Uh, and the mixture, the mixture components are based on the DAP spec itself. So for a single time series, yj, this corresponds to this first expression. So we have that the distribution of yj conditional on some other parameters is a weighted sum uh, where the weights are pi and they depend on s. That's where the covariates come in. Uh, a weighted sum of these other, this other object, g, and g is the density of adapt spec. Uh, so g is a density of a univariate, uh, for a univariate time series. Uh, it has unknown segments, uh, stationary within segments and so on, just what we've been talking about. Uh, but now we have a weighted sum and the weighted sum, the weights pi are constrained to sum to one. So this is a, this is a mixture model. Uh, and now I mentioned before that we want to predict at unobserved locations. And the reason we can do this is if we had a, have a hypothetical unobserved y uh, at, at some location where we don't have observations, we have a surface over pi. And if we estimate the surface over pi, we can compute this expression at unobserved locations. So that's how we can make predictions in principle at unobserved locations if we can solve every all the other any, any computational problems or so on on the way. Uh, and then for the mixture weights, uh, we need to parameterize them somehow. And we use the logistic stick breaking prior. This is a relatively recent development. Uh, and it writes pi L, so for the L mixture component, uh, it writes it as an expression like this. Uh, um, uh, this is a non-parametric model for these kind of problems. Um, uh, there's a lot of, there's an interesting interpretation of this, but I, uh, for time reasons, I'm not going to go into it. Um, but I will say that again, we actually, use Gaussian processes. So these surfaces, uh, new L, we end up with, with L of them. 
uh, well, L minus one actually, because one of them is constrained. And we assign a Gaussian process prior after a logit transform. So, so new is between zero and one uh, uh, as a result of the logit transform. And then, uh, and then we assign a Gaussian process uh, prior to that. So again, it's non-parametric. <clears throat> Uh, and as is common in mixture models, uh, we facilitate computation by introducing latent variables. Uh, so each time series gets the latent variable Z, uh, which varies between one and L. Uh, so for one of the mixture components. And we write this so that if you know the component indicator uh, Z, if you've, if you've observed it, then the likelihood of the time series YJ, one of the one of the time series is 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 exactly equal to adapt um, one of the mixture components G, which are, which are adapt spec. <clears throat> so another way of saying that is is that if you know Z, then you know which mixture component the observation came from. Now, of course, we don't observe Z, uh, so uh, so so we need to provide a distribution on Z. Uh, and the distribution on Z is that the probability that Z is equal to L is, is given exactly by pi L. And if you integrate out these unobserved Zs, then you, 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 recover, the, you recover the mixture sum. So it's, it's a really common trick in mixture models. I, I think most people who have used mixture models will have seen this, but I thought I'd talk about it in case you haven't. Uh, and this really facilitates computation because conditional on Z, Y has an adapt spec likelihood. So any work that was done to make adapt spec work uh, in terms of computation, like with Chain Monte Carlo, we can reuse it. Uh, and here's a quick overview of the model in a graph. <clears throat> uh, so to start on the left, um, we've got the logistic stick breaking prior, uh, covariates or locations, if you want to think about them, S. They go into the surfaces that define the mixture component probabilities which determines the probability distribution of the Zs, the latent indicators. Once you know that, then you know the, uh, the distribution of the time series Y, uh, and these have each mixture component has parameters theta, uh, and there are a capital L of them. <clears throat> and for inference, we use, uh, again, Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, and you end up sampling from this big joint posterior object here, um, uh, which has all the parameters in it. Uh, there's a lot hidden under here, which I guess I'm not talking about, but the parameters which govern that go into theta, the parameters of the surfaces mu, um, z, and then it's conditional, on, it's Bayesian, so it's the posterior, it's conditional on y, the data, and it's proportional to this exp exp um, expression. Uh, and uh, as is common in Gibbs samplers, you know, you we uh, we use a metropolis within Gibbs sampler. Actually, we sample we sample each of the parameters in turn. So we first sample each of the the uh, mixture component, the adapt spec parameters. We sample the component indicators, and then we sample the surfaces new, which which go into the mixture weights. Um, and the nice thing about MCMC is is it's it's really modular. Um, so like I said before, conditional on the indicators Z the distribution of the time series is just equivalent to adapt spec. So for this first step, we're able to take all the work that my co-authors did earlier in 2012 on adapt spec and, and, and use that MCMC uh, pretty much verbatim, uh, those MCMC steps pretty much verbatim. And we expand it with these extra steps. Okay. Um, and now I'll get into some examples. So um, this is a simulation, uh, simulated example. Uh, so like I've been talking about, the covariates here are spatial and there are two, so it's two dimensional. Um, and the map on the left gives a mapping from the spatial location to a, to a category. <clears throat> so the categories are indicated by the colors. So there's sort of this nonlinear sort of structure here. So um, there are four categories corresponding to these four colors. Uh, um, uh, and you know, you've got this sort of circle, this is one category, and then there's a split down the middle, another category on the other side in blue, and then this pink category, it's a little bit of a bigger circle, just to make it visually pleasing, I guess. 
Uh, and then the crosses are locations where we have measurements. And in this case, uh, the black crosses, I mean, in this case, a measurement corresponds to a whole time series, uh, maybe with some missing values, but, but, but the idea is, you know, some, maybe you put a, if this was a, a, a real map, maybe you put a sensor down and it collected time series. Uh, so you have those. <clears throat> and then there are some special locations uh, in green, D1, D2, D3, and D4. And these are also observed locations and I'll just use them as examples. And then there are these other special locations, T1, T2, T3, T4, and they're test locations. Uh, they're unobserved. So recall that part of the uh, part of the goal of this method is to is to estimate the time varying mean and spectrum at unobserved locations. Uh, so these are some test points. What we and there's one from each category. So the idea is we'll observe all of these black uh, time series at all of these black points. Uh, uh, black uh, crosses, excuse me. Uh, and then what we're really going to want to do is figure out whether we can correctly estimate the distribution of the time series of the unobserved points. Uh, and the way, continuing with the setup, uh, time series within each category have the same, the same process. So, so all of the time series within this category, uh, say this circle, uh, have the same process, not the same values, but the same underlying mean and spectrum. Uh, and then between categories, the processes differ sometimes substantially. And I've shown an example from each of the categories on the right. So the first, um, the first uh, category, uh, there's a, oh, and, the, and the, red, the red dashes here show missing values. So just demonstrating that missing values work. Uh, the first category has an abrupt change at about the midpoint in terms of its stochastic volatility. And the blue shows the mean, uh, so there's a small change in the mean. Uh, the second category has just a change in the mean, but no change in the variability around the mean, so the spectrum stays the same. Uh, the third category is completely stationary. The mean and spectrum spectra changes, um, the mean and spectra stay the same. And the third category has the spectrum change, but, but not the mean. So kind of all combinations are represented here. And I can show what happens when we estimate the time varying spectra. Uh, so the first two rows correspond to the observed locations, if you recall, uh, D1, oops, excuse me, D1 through D4. Uh, the first row shows the true spectra, uh, which we know because it's simulated data. Uh, and the second row shows the posterior estimated spectra. Uh, and uh, I guess not surprisingly, because we observe these locations and because we know from earlier work that adapt spec can estimate the spectra of a time series, the spectra are estimated pretty well. Uh, the only, I guess, uh, infidelity here is, is in D2, where um, it's picked up a bit of a change point uh, that might not be there, not, not a really abrupt. Uh, uh, sorry, not a really stark difference between the two segments here. Um, um, whereas in every other case, it looks pretty good. Uh, and I th we tend to think what's going on here is that category D2, it corresponds, D2 corresponds to the spatially small category without many examples. So there's some confusion for the model between um, this category and the surrounding category. Um, but um, actually, you know, I guess, being eternally optimistic, I, I think I think this is maybe not bad behavior by the model because um, uh, if you think about it, it really only has six or seven time series from which to decide what's going on in this category. It's not really sure perhaps where the boundary of the category is. So the fact that it, it, it splits the difference and, and makes it a little bit non-stationary is, 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 is to me not too bad. Uh, leave that up to you to decide. Uh, but more interesting to me are the, the test points. So if you recall, these are unobserved locations. Um, we don't have any data there. Uh, um, and, and the true spectra that would be observed uh, would, would be present uh, if you had data there uh, shown again in the first row. And the ex estimated spectra are shown, shown in the second row. So, so this shows that, you can, uh, that the model can, um, can estimate, can, can basically predict the spectra at unobserved rows. Uh, unobserved locations. Uh, and I haven't shown the mean here, but we've got similar work, uh, similar plots for the time varying mean. Uh, I just don't show them because the plots aren't as 
and as and as pretty uh, and as colourful. Um, um, but the same thing happens where uh, really just based on covariates uh, from observing the observed locations, you can you can predict the spectra and the mean at unobserved locations. So um, <clears throat> moving on into a real example. Uh, so the problem, of course, with real data examples is that you, you don't know the truth. So everything I'm going to show you now is just uh, estimates. Um, but in this example, we, we got some time series of monthly rainfall from the Bureau of Meteorology. And those are collected at, uh, so this is a map of Australia. Um, and those examples are collected at 151 locations, again, shown by the, by the crosses. Um, uh, and these, there are actually a lot more locations than this in that the Bureau of Meteorology have available, but, but these locations are special because they have a, a really long record going back about 100 years uh, with, with pretty good temporal coverage. Uh, but one thing you'll note is that the spatial coverage varies a lot over the continent. So uh, in the desert, uh, the vast central desert, there aren't that many observations, whereas in, in the dense coastal areas, a densely populated uh, coastal areas or the agriculturally significant areas. There are lots of, lots of observations, um, not so many in the tropics. Um, yeah, and then uh, again, four of, the, four of the locations shown in green are picked out. Um, these are just their station numbers. The Bureau of Meteorology assigns a station number. Uh, they're picked out and we'll see, some, we'll see those as example sites. Uh, and then again, we pick four red test points, um, test point one through test point four. Uh, and these are at locations that don't have uh, any, um, uh, any observations. So some of them are closer to other observations. Um, they're just kind of spaced out around the continent. That's, that's the idea. Um, but say test point one is sort of a couple of hundred kilometers from any measurement sites. Test point two is in between two. Test points three and four are in pretty densely observed areas. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're, they're locations that just, oh, excuse me, just by way of example, we'd like to predict um, the properties of rainfall at. Uh, and just to show you what the time series look like, here are the four example sites. Uh, and they show uh, on the horizontal axis, axis you have the, the, the date, uh, recalling these are, these are monthly time series. Uh, and on the vertical axis, it shows the average rainfall in millimetres for the month. <clears throat> uh, and you can see that these sites are pretty different in, 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 in many ways. So the, the first two sites differ, uh, well, they differ for one in their, in their volatility, um, uh, in that sort of the maximum scale uh, differs a lot, um, but they also differ in their, in their spectral properties. Uh, the first two sites, I guess to the eye, um, especially the second site, uh, have, a, have a real periodicity to them. Uh, and this is rainfall. Uh, and as we know, you know, it, it rains more in, in, in the southern parts of the country. It rains more in the winter and, and, and tends to rain less in the summer. And the opposite pattern is true in the, um, in the tropics. So what we what what this cycle is 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 twelve months period of twelve months. It's it's a it's a seasonal cycle governed by the Earth's um, the Earth's uh, um, uh, passage around the sun. <clears throat> uh, whereas the bottom two sites, even though of course they're still they're still subject to 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 the Earth's passage around the sun, they're not so obviously cyclical. Um, and and this is this is this is a common um, observation. So. Um, um, Places like uh, Perth have really, really seasonal rainfall, whereas places like Sydney uh, and Wollongong is an example where I'm from, they have, uh, have a pretty uniform rainfall. It doesn't actually vary much from summer to winter. Uh, yeah, so it's a pretty varied data set, I guess is the point I'm trying to show. Um, and the final thing I'll point out is, uh, again, there are these little red markers that show unobserved uh, uh, missing values. So there are some periods where the the you know maybe the station was broken or um, back in the earlier days the people uh, the observations were collected manually you know by by people who went out and, and emptied a bucket basically and, um, or a rain gauge is the technical term uh, so maybe they were sick or something like that and they couldn't collect the observations uh, yeah lots of features here and here are here are the estimated spectra for the observed locations in the top row. Uh, 
uh, and the test unobserved locations in the bottom row. And there are these little inset maps which show you where, where it is just for convenience because I wouldn't be able to remember. Um, and sure enough, in the observed locations, there's a dominant cycle at one on 12, um, uh, frequency one on 12, which is in per months here, or the period is shown on the right, so 12 months. Uh, so this is the seasonality that we talked about. That's good to see it. Um, it's not really, it would be concerning for this method if we didn't see it. Um, and then more interestingly, uh, oh, and I should point out that um, as we expected, there's a lot of seasonality at some of these sites and less seasonality at other sites. And also the, um, uh, oh, I've lost the color scale, but uh, you know, red is, red is high and, and blue is low. The, um, the scale is, uh, the variability is higher um, at some sites and lower at other sites, just like we saw in these plots. Um, uh, and you can actually see some changes over time. Um, so for example, looking at the top right plot, um, there's a period of increased rainfall volatility around the 1950s and 1960s. This is a known event. Um, so it's nice to see that gets picked up. Um, and we have more details on doing some inference on that in our manuscript, uh, which I'll link to later. Um, and then finally, I'll show the test points down the bottom. So th these, um, these are the unobserved locations. Um, and, um, and yeah, what you can see is that we were able to, to estimate the spectra at unobserved locations as we wanted to. Um, in principle, this could be useful to a decision maker who's considering, uh, I don't know, building something at a location which, which doesn't have many observations and could use a method like this to, to, get, to characterize the rainfall at that location. Um, and one more example well, I've, uh, 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 is um, uh, maybe a little bit more per pertinent to, to what's been going on in the world lately. Um, these are weekly time series of measles incidents, uh, measles incidents per 100,000 people from the United States. Uh, so, you know, infectious diseases are uh, all the, uh, a very interesting uh, topic at the moment, although we, we built this model before, before coronavirus uh, upended our lives. Um, now, this data set covers all the states in the US, um, but I'm just showing four example time series here. Uh, and these are collected weekly to remind you. Um, and they're from four states, Arizona, Florida, Maine, and Washington. <clears throat> and the really cool feature of this data set uh, and pretty applicable to today again, is it's a dramatic change. It starts at around 1963, uh, starts gradually and then picks up. Uh, and it, 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 um, if you know vaccine history, 1963 was the, license, the date of licensing of the first measles vaccine. And they started to roll it out in, in successive public health campaigns from then on. Um, now, what you can see is that's a, that causes a pretty dramatic change in the incidence of measles. Uh, in fact, before the vaccine, there was a saying which said that measles was as inevitable as death and taxes, um, um, which are pretty inevitable. Um, but afterwards, it, it almost disappeared and very few people get um, measles now uh, as per these time series. And I guess we can hope that something similar will happen for us with coronavirus. Um, and here are the estimated spectra. <clears throat> and you can see that the change is, is pretty dramatic. So um, before, uh, for the, the, the same four states, by the way. Uh, so before the, um, before the vaccine, so that's before this sort of 19... 60s. Um, you can actually see if you if you squint uh, a seasonal cycle uh, of uh, an annual cycle of 52 weeks. It, it, it's a bit indistinct. I mean, this was in, in, at some states, but th this disease just raged, you know. Um, but it would come and go sometimes in annual cycles, you know, through through winter and so on, when people were a bit more immune vulnerable. Um, um, but then in the introduction of the vaccine and successive vaccination campaigns, you see the volatility drop off to to almost nil, and and that's the situation today. Uh, and there's no, there's no evidence of the seasonal cycle in measles in, in, in the post-vaccine period. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so that's, that, that's measles. Um, um, and, and that's really all I have to talk about, although um, in the interest of uh, 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 being scholarly, I guess I'll talk a little bit about the limitations of the method. Um, so three, three main ones that, that, that we would love to address at some point. Um, I mentioned we use the Whittle likelihood uh, as a non-parametric approximation um, 
to the likelihood, uh, which is parameterized in terms of the spectrum. And that, that's the way back when we were talking about uh, univariate time series and adapt spec, that's, that's used for the likelihood within a segment. <clears throat> it's actually known to be inefficient for non-Gaussian time series and or small sample sizes. Uh, so uh, it depends on the, what, you, what you apply it to. The me measles is actually underlying its it's um it's 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 non-zero. It's 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 um it's it's reasonably uh, moderately non-Gaussian. That's it's average to weak, so it's not too bad. Um, but that's something we'd love to improve on. Uh, and and there has been some some other some research on improving the middle likelihood. Um, uh, another 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 limitation is we don't really explicitly account for measurement error, so it's difficult to to separate signal and noise. Um, I mean, if the measurement error is just like IID noise. Uh, that will show up as in it just in the spectrum as increasing the level of the spectrum everywhere. Um, but if the measurement error is actually changing over time, if it's part of the non-stationarity, we can't separate that out right now. It would be a really interesting extension. Um, and, and then a final, a final limitation is that the covariates, uh, which have often been the space, spatial location, they're, they're actually time invariants. So at the moment, we don't have any a method for integrating covariates um, uh, into this through time, um, which would be really great because it'd be nice if the covariates could help us decide when there are cut points and stuff like that. Uh, so that's another extension that could be considered. But um, but if you have spatial data, a spatial time series, it, it works. Um, uh, and yeah, so finally, this is my final slide. So uh, preprints is on archive. Um, it's been submitted. We'll see. We'll see what reviewers think. Um, the code for everything, all the plots you've seen, um, the paper uh, are on GitHub at this location. Um, there is an R package called Bayes spec, which contains univariate adapt spec. The multiple, multivariate, uh, multiple time series methods aren't available in it yet, but they, but they will be um, <clears throat> at some point. Uh, and if you wanted access to it, I could give you that version of the package. Uh, um, I could send it to you. Uh, in fact, it's in this repository here. Um, yeah, and that's that's it. So um, so thank you, uh, thanks for listening, and I'm yeah I'm happy to happy to answer any questions. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, let us thank Michael for his very interesting talk. So we have one question in the chat. So uh, this question is from Dan. So um, so the the audience asks at page ten. So uh, could you please uh, go to page ten? Uh, or maybe nine? Uh, yeah, yeah, this page. Uh, yeah. So the audience asked, uh, th uh, this is showing a map estimate of spectral density, right? Uh, posterior mean, not map. Ah, yeah. Um, the map would potentially have dramatic changes in it, yeah. And so uh, if you have more questions, you can directly unmute yourself and ask Michael directly. Any questions or comments? So Michael, I, I actually have a lot of uh, questions. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, I, I, I will only uh, consider some. So the first question is about the Wittor approximation. So, uh, sure. so, so you uh, basically use the Wittor approximation in your uh, posterior mean, right? Uh, the posterior distribution, right? Eventually. So uh, my question is that, uh, do you need to assume some uh, parametric structure for the spectral density? When yes. Um, well, um... We, we, we do, if you consider a Gaussian process to be parametric. So um, 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 uh, the Gaussian, the, the choice, I, sorry, I glossed over it, but, but the choice of Gaussian process, there, there are many different possible parameterizations of a Gaussian process. Um, the choice of Gaussian process is, um, is important because it determines how smooth do you think the spectrum is. Um, so you can have very, very smooth Gaussian processes where the prior assumes the prior assumes that the spectrum will be really smooth, and then you'll, you know, inevitably estimate a posterior um, um, a posterior um, spectrum which is smooth, or you can you can have you can have less smooth ones. Um, so um, it, I, I guess I would describe it as semi-parametric. So you make some choices that bring your assumptions, but at the end of the day. The, the possible function space that the Gaussian process spans is, 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 is really wide. So um, in the limit of a really long time series where you have a lot of information, you know, you, 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 you will estimate the spectral density um, 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 pretty accurately. Um, but yeah, uh, there's, there, there are some assumptions which are brought here and, and that the main, 
the main the main assumption is about the smoothness of the spectral density. That's the key. That's the key assumption that the Gaussian process brings, and how smooth it is. And and that comes up because um, you know we have these peaks in the spectra, and the, the more dramatic the peak is, the the less smooth the Gaussian process needs to be because it needs to accommodate a really sudden a really sudden change in the spectra. So all of the time series, you know, you know, it it, it comes down to um, a little bit of uh, injection of prior information um, about how smooth the time series is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we have another question from chat uh, from Louis. So could you please comment on running time? I guess it is dependent on time series length and number of time series in case of adapt spec X. Yes. Okay. So um, the runtime, um, the runtime is uh, for a univariate time series. It, it's uh, it's, it's actually a complicated question. So, so the Whittle likelihood, because it uses a periodogram, periodogram is, is pretty fast to evaluate. It's n log n, uh, order n log n. Um, but, but more important is the mixing time of the MCMC algorithm. So for time series that have really, um, really straightforward cut points, like, like the example, the abruptly changing one on the left here, it, it's really fast because it just settles on those it just settles on those cut points and then um, um, and then chain and then um, um, uh, and then and then everything is really efficient from then. Whereas for less less obvious time series, it can take a bit longer. But but for for example, these univariate time series, I computed these plots in in um, forty seconds. So so it's 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 pretty fast. Uh, these are only five hundred and twelve time series long. Um, five hundred and twelve time periods long. Um, it's it's quite feasible to, to for a univariate time series to push this up to. I've done it for tens of thousands of observations for a univariate time series. Um, the more severe limitations come in adapt spec x. It's cubic in the number of sites. Um, so I guess generally when things are cubic, um, uh, when things are cubic, you're sort of limited to you're sort of limited in the low thousands. I've tried it up to. I've tried it up to sort of 200 sites and, and each of the locations, each, each time series is about 1500, um, 1500 observations long. And that takes about, takes about three hours. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's difficult because, you know, you can have an example where the mixing is really bad and you have to run the MCMC sampler for longer. Um, but for the examples that I show uh, with the many sites, it's sort of two, two to three hours, depending on how fast, two to three to four hours, depending on how fast your computer is. Yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah, also thanks from the chat. Um, any more questions, comments? Uh, you can directly unmute. Yeah, um, I've got one if I may. Yeah, please. Yeah, so I was just wondering, um, you had, uh, you talked about the smoothing of the spectral density within um, a stationary, um, what do you call the sections between change uh, points? Se segment, yeah. Segment, yes. Um, and so is there any smoothing between segments? Like are the special spectral entities of adjacent segments informing each other? I didn't see that. Uh, um, I guess it's in the likelihood somewhere. So so the that will only occur that will occur insofar as the cut points are uncertain. So um, so in between <clears throat> in the posterior distribution, the, the, the boundaries of the, the segments are uncertain. Uh, so if, if it's not clear that um, where the cut point should be, sometimes um, a particular time period will, will fall to the left of the cut point, sometimes it will fall to the right, and it will correspondingly contribute information to that, to that segment in the posterior. Um, but in the generative process, no, like in the generative process, it, it's got the cut points, but in the posterior, yes, there's some smoothing, um, but there's no, there's no explicit uh, in a generative sense, at the moment, no explicit borrowing of information between segments. It just it just happens in the posterior when the segments are um when the segments are um uncertain. Yeah. Ah, uh, yep, got it. So we're effectively mixing. Uh, we're mixture models at these sort of points where there's uncertainty around the segment boundaries. Ex exactly. This is mixed. I didn't say it, but this is mixtures all the way down. Um, so so this mixture, this this expression for univariate adapt spec, you can write this as a mixture as well, and and so you do get. You do get you do get um, smoothing as you do with mixture models. You always do. So yeah. Ah, excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, more questions? 
So I, I need to remind that, uh, so if you do not want your face to be recorded, you, you need to close, otherwise uh, stop video, otherwise your face will be online. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so I, I have more questions about uh, your cut, cutting points. Okay. So, so from my understanding, uh, it's kind of related to the regime switching model, right? So uh, your cutting points are basically different regimes, uh, uh, right? Um, yeah, so the, the cut points define, um, this is maybe the, uh, the best plot. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. The cut points define, um, Conditional on a, a single set of cut points. Remember that they're uncertain. It defines different regions. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so based on my understanding, so uh, your spec X method is that the those covariates X determines the regimes, and then the regimes determine the uh, different spectral density, right? Uh, oh yeah. So you're talking about um, sorry, excuse me, like like something like this plot where you have different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Space. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sure. Yep, yep. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, but they're not cut points. In this case, it's not. It's not. It's not um, discrete cut points. So, so we actually have um, a smooth surface of mixture probabilities pi of s. So the example in the example, the truth was non-smooth, but but the estimated spectra will have will the not spectra. Excuse me. The estimated um, probability of being in each mixture component will be will be smooth actually. In, in, it's non-parametric, so it can pick up smooth and non-smooth functions. But anyway, so, sorry, perhaps you have more to your question. I'll let you. I'll let you continue. Yeah, yeah, but really, thanks, thanks for your for your more uh, comments. And 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 also, so um, so you you also mentioned that you need to estimate the regimes first, right? And then use the estimated regime to have the posterior distribution, right? Um, well, it, it everything is estimated jointly. Um, so we, it's not a two-stage estimation process. All of the unknowns are estimated jointly through Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, so in the, I mean, I showed the, I showed this um, algorithm, but actually there's actually an outer loop around here where we we, we sample these actually 10,000, 50,000 times, and we end up with a joint sample from this probability distribution at the top. Um, so so we. We don't just end up with a single estimate of the cut points or the regions. We end up with a posterior distribution over the cut points in the regions. So, sorry, the slide was a little unclear. I should I should have put the outer iteration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think thanks for your explanation. So maybe I just misunderstand. So uh, yeah, I, I think as long as they are estimated jointly, I think it's uh, really good. Uh, and also, have you uh, look at the estimated regimes whether or not it's reasonable uh, in in real practice? Um, uh, yeah, so um, I have for for the simulated example, yes, for example. So they look pretty. I mean, they're not perfect circles, but um, the regions you get you get look, look they they match this structure. I don't have the plot handy right now. Um, um, for the for the rainfall, it's a lot more complicated because um, because you end up you know you've got you actually end up with like ten or fifteen different regions, and um, there's a lot of smoothing between the regions on the boundaries, so it's difficult to interpret the regions directly, which is why we look at the we look at the spectra, which really tell us everything um, everything everything we want to know. So, so from my perspective, the the reason you, you you smooth the regions is to get an estimate of the spectra. The regions, to me, so far haven't been of enormous interest, but they they could be. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any more questions, comments? So we can have maybe uh, several minutes. So, so I, I last have uh, two questions about the uh, your real data analysis. You you mentioned about the limitations uh, because uh, because from my understanding, I actually have a look uh, I have had a look at the rainfall data. So a lot of zeros, as you mentioned, is not Gaussian. So, right. Uh, so do you consider, for instance, some future study to overcome the problem with a lot of zeros in the rainfall? Um. Well, well the, the first thing is that's one of the reasons where we worked with monthly rainfall instead of daily because there are far fewer zeros in monthly rainfall at most locations than um, daily and I have done work on daily rainfall before um, yeah um, we haven't we haven't worked on it yet but I, I um, so when I when I say no explicit accounting for measurement error and non-gaussian these two things are linked so you could actually think of there as being a hierarchical model where you have say, um, a non-Gaussian um, observation model, you know, which which might be counts or something like that. 
uh, with a latent space behind it. Um, so another, so say, say, say in the case of counts, you could have a Poisson, you could have like a, um, a Cox Gaussian process where you have a, um, um, a Poisson um, observation density, but behind it, you have a latent Gaussian process. It would be really nice to put something like a DAP spec behind a hierarchical structure like that. And that could address some of the issues that you're talking about. We haven't done it yet. There are some challenges there, but it's a, it, it's a really, it'd be a great extension. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and another question is about the, uh, you mentioned about the missing. So uh, I'm not sure about it, but do you require that for, for each time, uh, for each observation of time, you have, uh, you do not necessarily need to have all the locations, right? You only need to have a part of locations. Um, yeah, so, so what we require is that the, um, uh, so if you think about it as a time series at a location, um, it's fine if some of the, um, it, it doesn't matter what time indices are missing um, between different locations. I mean, uh, yeah, so th there's no, th the main limitation I guess I should have written here is that we need the times to be collected. The, the, the spatial locations don't have to be on a grid, but the time, the time periods do have to be on a regular, um, regular grid, but it's okay if some of the location, some of the time periods are missing. Whereas of course, um, with a spatial model like we have, um, you know, there's an infinite, there are infinite possible locations here. And most, you know, the, 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 the set of, I mean, if you, to make a sort of silly joke, the set of locations that are missing is a, is a set of measure one, right? Like most locations we don't observe because you only observe a few locations, but that's completely fine. Um, but yeah, it's the time periods. If you think of the, the, the time series as at each location, it's fine if some of those observations are missing. It doesn't matter which ones. Um, I mean, if you were missing a lot of observations from the beginning of the time series, you might worry about boundary effects, but you know that, that would be true for any method. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So any more questions, comments? OK. So uh, we'll, uh, I will leave several minutes after the, this seminar. So if you want to chat with our speaker, I, I think for, for more, uh, a little bit more time. So uh, you, you can uh, wait until the end. And really thanks uh, our speaker, Michael, for his very interesting talk and also very patient explanations for my questions. <laughs> really, thank you. And, uh, and thank you all for joining this Zoom seminar. And next week, we are going to have Professor Andrew Wood from uh, ANU to present and the notification has been sent. So please take care and stay well and safe and see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you and thanks everyone for your questions. Happy to chat for a while. So if you would like to chat with the speaker, you can directly unmute. Thank you. So I will stop recording. <laughs>